God poured His fire on the day of Pentecost, and He still opened heaven to pour out His fire in our generation. May the fire of the Lord burn on the inside of you. Brings revival into your life. Send you out to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May He use you to be a carrier of the fire of revival. May the Lord anoint you. May the fire of God burn every day on the inside of you. And the Lord will be glorified through you. May the grace of God work in your life, and you become fruitful, and you will have many rewards in heaven. May the Lord get the glory through your life. Let us pray, Father. We thank you so much, Lord, that we can learn the truth again concerning why Christians suffer. We want to understand the truth, the reason, and we want to protect ourselves from facing unnecessary sufferings, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, for your love, your kindness to us, your grace for us, Lord, and we commit this time to you. We want to hear. From the Holy Spirit, you say in the Bible, "Let those who have ears listen to what the Spirit says." So now we have ears to listen to you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. In the last session, we learn the reasons of suffering. We learn four things. Number one, lack of knowledge. Many Christians got into trouble because they have no knowledge of God. They don't do their homework. They are not diligent and studious in listening to the Word of God, reading the Bible, studying the Bible. Go to the class, go to church, listen to the sermon carefully. Nowadays, we have so much distraction. When I walk into the lounge in the operating room, you know, operating room, we have a lounge that people can rest, drink some coffee or. Eat some lunch time. Many years ago, 20 years ago, we when we walk in, we will see face to face. We talk. How are you? How are your kids doing? But today, when you walk in, everyone <laughs> everyone all the nurses and nurse assistant and anesthesiologists they eat. We don't talk anymore. So much distraction, and the same thing in the church today. When I stand on the pulpit, sometimes I have to pray this way: God help us to get out from the smartphone right now, <laughs> because people kind of try to try to pretend that they listen to me. They still watch, do something in the smartphone. That's why the, it's hard for God to speak to them because their attention is pulled away to something else. If we're gonna pay attention to the word, let's pay attention. Proverbs chapter four. You remember? If you pay attention to my word, give your ear to what I'm saying, incline your ear and receive it in the midst of your heart. There are lives in my word. And medicine. So when you know the word, you can have life. You can have victory, and the enemy gonna have a hard time destroying you. Amen. So we need to know the word, and not only that, we need to practice the word. Three, we need to stop being stubborn and prideful, and think that we know more than God and argue with Him. 
whatever God say, yes and amen, and do it. Don't argue with Him. Obey Him. Obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Learn how to listen to the witness of the Spirit on the inside of you. I hope you listen to the whole series about being led by the Spirit of God. Very detailed teaching how to be led by the Spirit. And you can learn how to walk by the Spirit every day. You can avoid traffic. You can avoid accident. You can avoid making wrong decision because you listen to the Spirit of the living God. Please, it's in the YouTube. You can listen. I think in English called Spirit Let Living, the terminology. Spirit Let Living, the whole series in there. Not only that, you need to also um, learn how to walk in the truth of God. You need to really live in holiness and righteousness. There are two words when we talk about walking with God. One word called justification or righteousness. Another word called holiness or sanctification. Sanctification and holiness in the same group. Righteousness and justification in the same group. What, does it mean? what do they mean, these two words? The justification and righteousness are our position in Christ. We are justified by what Jesus did for us at the cross. He took our sin and he gave us righteousness. So I have the position, legal position, of being a saint or a righteous man by position. I speak English with accent. Last Sunday, one of my members didn't come to church. He watched live stream. And right after the sermon, I walked out, I walked to my office to grab something, and I saw a message in line. 22nd, this man say, uh, you say it wrong in English. You have to say it this way. I don't remember the word uh, now. I, I still keep it so I can listen again how I say it in English because my accent was wrong for that word, for two words actually. So you can see that even though I'm still speaking with accent, I still look like Chinese Thai, but I am legally American. I walk into Germany with American passport. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the German man there, oh, American, get in. No problem. Positionally, I am righteous. I am American. But I'm not totally American because I was not born here. I still speak with accent. I'm still learning to speak good English better and better each year. That is position. But in reality, we have another word, sanctification and holiness. That is a real thing, that you live a holy life. It's not just by position. By position, I am American citizen. But sanctification-wise, I try to improve my English-speaking American way. I try to improve the way I live in America to be a real American citizen. I try to learn how to be a good American citizen. It takes some time to learn and change the way I live. Is that right? So I, when I first came to America, I ate dinner at the restaurant. I never put any tip, maybe $5 tip or two cent tip, because that is in Thailand. <laughs> Thailand, we just put two baht tip. But after a while, I learned in America, you cannot do that. 15%. Pastor Da is very generous. Give 20% every time. 20% tips. Because we try to adjust to culture here that we need to take care of this server. They don't have a lot of salary. We need to take care of them. But we never outgive God anyway. We bless people. And God bless us back anyway. Amen? Now a lot of restaurants like us to go. <laughs> so we need to be sanctified to live a holy life. We are sinners by nature. And God wants to change us to live a holy life, no sin. How He does that? He teaches us the Word. He gives us the Word to sanctify us. Two, He gives us the fire or the Holy Spirit 
So that's the reason why I lay hand every Sunday at church, unless we have lunch or something. So we lay hand to let the Holy Spirit sanctify, clean up the junk out of our life, so that we have less sinful nature on the inside and we can live a holy life. We we need the Word and we need the Holy Spirit to be able to live a holy life and stop sinning. Sin leads to destruction, corruption, and death. When I look at sin, as a doctor, I have seen pus, abscess. Have you, how many people have seen abscess? I'm not talking about small abscess. Huge abscess. Big, big mass that inside pus. And if you don't drain it, you don't get rid of it, the patient will die. Because the bacteria will go into the bloodstream and cause we call sepsic, septicemia. The word septicemia means bacteria spread to all over the body. And then the next term is sepsis. Sepsis means the whole body affected by bacteria. And eventually the heart can stop pumping and blood pressure will go down and the patient will die. Have you ever seen cancer with your life, with your own eyes? I have. I open up the body and I see cancer. And when I look at the cancer, I hate it because cancer can destroy people. Thank God for the medical technology that nowadays we can cure cancer with medication, radiation, and many things. Thank God for the medical doctors. But still, to me, sin is abscess. Sin is, ap- is cancer. Don't entertain it. It will kill you eventually. If you look at sin that way, you don't want to get involved with sin at all. Not at all. Amen? Amen. Because you're going to suffer later on if you keep living in sin. Now, let's look at another reason for suffering. 1 Corinthians, I know this is a long passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 30. But in what I instruct you, next, I do not commend you. Because when you meet together, this is this talking about church life. People come together in a meeting as a church. It is not for the better, but for the worse. For or in the first place, when you assemble as a congregation. I hear that there are cliques, division, and factions. Group of Thai, group of Filipino, group of Americans, group of Chinese sitting together, hang out together, cliques. I don't want to talk to the Thai people. They eat spicy food. I don't want to talk to Americans. They eat steak. No taste like Thai. I want to be with my cliques, my group of people here among you, and I, in part, believe it. Or doubtless there have to be factions or parties among you in order that they who are genuine and of approved fitness may become evident and plainly recognized among you. In other words, it's so clear in that church in Corinth that people don't love each other. They really have division among brother and sister. Division not only language and nationality and skin color. So when you gather for your meetings, it is not the supper institute by the Lord that you eat. Or in eating each one, hurries to get his own supper first, not waiting for the poor. And one goes hungry while another gets drunk. What? So they have clicked not only in language, but also in social group. Rich people, hey, I eat first. The poor people sit there waiting for food. They have cliques among social status as well. All rich people sit together, poor people sit together. What do you have no houses in which to eat or, and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and mean to show contempt for it? Why you humiliate those who are poor and have no homes and have brought no food? What shall I say to you? 
Shall I commend you in this? No, most certainly I will not. For I receive from the Lord Himself that which I pass on to you. It was given to me personally that the Lord Jesus, on the night he, when He was tre- treacherously delivered up, and why His betrayal was in progress, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, "Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you." Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. Similarly, when supper was ended, he took the cup also, saying, "This cup is new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to call me to remembrance." This is communion. They sat together, ate bread, and the uh, wine together. The uh, f- Jewish together, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until He comes again. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of Him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man thoroughly examine himself. You remember in the last teaching, I say, examine yourself. Look at your heart, and only when he has done so should he eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone, I'm going to come to the point now. For anyone who eats and drinks without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that is, it is Christ's body. Eats and drinks a sentence or a verdict of judgment upon himself. That careless and unworthy participation is the reason many of you are weak and sickly, and quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. The thirtieth worth say. Many are sick in the church. Many get into deadly situation, and some of them even died at young age, die beforehand, get into trouble. The apostle Paul say, the reason some Christians suffer is one of them. They don't examine themselves, and they despise the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we talk about body, there are two bodies. One is the real body of Jesus on the cross. They did not care much about Jesus. They walk into the church, and they just say, "Hey, I don't care about that poor guy. Jesus, you die for them. I don't care." They really dishonor Jesus. But the body today is what the church. When you come into the church and treat people in the church in the dishonorable way, discrimination, look down on people, have cliques group in the church, you don't even honor poor people, you treat the church without respect, you can get into trouble. You need to understand this: the church is the apple of God's eyes. It is his bride. You know, people can say any bad thing about me. I don't care much. But if people say bad thing about Pastor Da, you know that I third degree back bell. <laughs> you have to face me. You can talk bad about me. That's okay. I'm dead. I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead already. I don't feel pain. But don't touch my wife. Is that right? The same thing. Don't mistreat the church of Jesus. Amen. Don't bring division, bad stuff into the church that cause people to hurt or come in and cheat somebody money. Take advantage of a woman in the church. Come in and cause division and rebel against pastors and cause all the chaos and problem in the church. 
you, you don't respect the church of Jesus Christ, you can be in trouble because you touch the apple of his eyes. You touch his bride. You touch the people he died for. So basically, I'm not going to open my mouth to attack any other churches. I'm not going to go to tell some member of another church, hey, leave your church, come to my church. That church is bad. No, it's not my business. My job is to pray for the church, love the church, support the church. And definitely, in my own church, I'm going to do everything to honor, to build, to bring love, unity, and good things to the church. I treat members with respect. I treat God's member with honor, and I just want the good things to happen to them. I want good things to happen to you. I'm not going to take advantage of you. I'm not here to take anything from you. I, I loved you. We love each other. We're going to really respect the church of God. Amen. Do anything to build the church, to make good things happen in the church, to honor God in the church, to honor Jesus in the church, honor Him and honor His church. And if we keep doing that, we are in special protection. Sickness and disease cannot touch us. I believe I trained people in New Hope International pe uh, Church very well. In the past 30-something years, we rarely see people get sick and die. We never, uh, I rarely have to perform funeral ceremony in a church. Only maybe a, a couple, only one. Yes, but he came from another church. He was sick before he came. So he, uh, that's out of my control. I, we pray, we pray, but God took him away. Anyway, but people who grow up in the church, all the kids, all the family, young family, marry in the church, they all do well. They, no one gets sick. Or if they get sick, they heal very fast. Amen. Because we train people to love the church and to honor the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This scripture, rarely people talk about it. Why some Christians die? Why some Christians get sick? And the Apostle Paul say clearly, they don't care about the church of Jesus. They treat the church without respect. I tell you, if you want God to give you favor, if you want God to really treat you special, love His church. Amen. Treat His church very well. Treat your pastor very well. Amen. Respect them. Amen. Respect one another in the church. Come into church with the attitude of, I'm here to build. I'm not here to destroy. I'm here to encourage. I'm here to give. I'm here to serve. What can I do to build you up? What can I do to make you become stronger? What can I do to support you? That kind of attitude. No jealousy. No fighting. No discrimination. Keep your heart right to love the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, that's one of the reasons people get into trouble. Number five. Now, number six. The reason why Christians suffer. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times times seven. That's what Pastor Dan need to do for me. <laughs> 70 times seven. Therefore, this is just for one mistake though. If I keep doing the same mistake 490 times. I hope not. But another mistake, still 70 times seven. Okay. This is not about whole life. Just one mistake. Repeating mistake. If you keep making the same mistake again, 70 times 7. Do you know why 70? Seven? 7 is a perfect number. It means you perfectly forgive people and with 10. More and more. No stop. 
always forgiving. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had began, begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and he, with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Wow, gave up the debt. No more. You don't have to pay me anymore. With compassion. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Wow. Choking. Saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him. Saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have co had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. A long story here. The sixth reason why Christians suffer unforgiveness. How many people agree with me? Unforgiveness is the most difficult thing to do in life. When people hurt your feeling, ah, you try to forgive, but it's very hard. And sometimes the devil will also remind you, remember that day? <laughs> and he knows that this is something he can destroy us by putting us in unforgiving situation all the time. If you love yourself, forgive those who hurt you. God forgives you. God has forgiven you. We should forgive other people. And if you decide not to forgive, the Lord cannot protect you anymore. The protection is gone. And who are going to come and attack you? The torturers. Who are the torturers? Demons. And sometimes bad people. If you don't forgive, you open the door for demons to come and attack you with sickness and disease, steal your money, steal your life, accident, bad things can happen to you because you don't forgive. I heard the story 25 years ago. A woman was close to death with cancer, final state cancer. And she went to, to many, many crusades for the great preacher to lay hand on her. She went to see doctors and no one can help her. She was going downhill. The cancer spread all over her body. And one day she came to a brother in Christ. And the brother asked her, are you holding grudges against anybody right now? That lady said, yes, I do. Who? My ex-husband. And my God. I am mad at my God because my husband walked out of me with a young woman. And I'm mad at my husband. And I never forgive both of them. 
God and husband. And that Christian brother say, "Can you do me a favor? Can you forgive both of them and let them go?" She decided to forgive that day. She prayed, forgiving. She said, "God, I'm sorry. I have been mad at you. I have been mad at my ex-husband. I forgive." After that day, cancer was gone. I heard another story in the, uh, in the sermon. Uh, uh, African American preacher, a man walk out to him with some kind of problem in the hand, uh, start to have nerve problem and the hand shrivel like this, and then that pastor say, "Before I lay hand on you, can I ask you something? Yes, are you mad at somebody and not forgive? Yes, can you forgive right now? Okay, that's gone Amen. within one second." Sometimes, the main reason that we are in trouble is because we don't forgive people. Unforgiveness is a big problem on earth right now. How many people can raise hand and say, "I have never been offended by anybody"? Raise your hand up. <laughs> How many people have never been cheated by somebody? Have. We, How many people have not been hurt by anybody at all? Your life is so smooth. <laughs> no one hurt you. Everything's so good, like walking on the rose garden. No, we have been hurt. We have been cheated. We have been gossiped about. Let them go. Forgive them. Amen. Amen. If you love yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Mark chapter 11, 25 to 26. Every Sunday when you come to church, you should do this. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Forgive your husband. <laughs> Forgive your wife. <laughs> Forgive your pastor. Forgive your daddy and your mommy. Really, there's no perfect dad. There's no perfect mom. They all make mistake. I think the person that you have a hard time forgiving is your close relative and friend or spouse or something. Your own kids, your own parents, your uncle, auntie, your uh, mother-in-law. Forgive them. Amen. Life is full of hurt. Let us become Christian that way. Okay, let's forgive. Let them go. Forgive. For me, I forgive my ex-members, who sometimes give me a hard time. Being a pastor, I understand why some people don't want to be pastor. I'd rather be a traveling evangelist. Just go city and preach, and then bye bye, gone. <laughs> Because it's easier. You just preach and lay hand and collect money and gone. But to be a pastor, you get hurt all the time. People may say bad things about you. They leave the church. Sometimes, you know, I, I sometimes I take a couple to Hawaii with me, or go to Disney World with me. I pay for them. Two days, two years later, they put in a blog how bad I am. In the internet, I said, "What? I took you to Disney World. <laughs> I pay for the ticket, and now you don't want to talk to me, and you hate me because I move in the fire, lay hand on people, and they hate me with a good, wrong reason. I didn't hurt anybody, I never cheat anybody in the church, but because the devil hate me, 
so he can have to hurt me by using somebody that I love so much to hurt my feeling. This is happen all the time. The devil know how to attack you, and if you keep that bitterness, you're gonna be hurt too. So when people hurt you, just let them go and say bye bye. God bless you. I love you no matter what. Let them go. Amen. 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 So we come back this afternoon and continue number seven, eight, and nine. Okay, because we need to have lunch. And how many people say from today on I will forgive? How many people say from today on I will not live in sin? How many people say from today on I will honor the church of God? I will treat the church very well. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for teaching us all these truths, and we can prevent ourselves from getting into trouble, doing the wrong things that make you unhappy with us and make you grieve, Lord. We want to repent. We want to do the right thing before your eyes, and you shall be. So please with us, Father, and your favor will be upon us. Your divine protection, your canopy of protection will be upon us. You, we will live under your feathers, under your wing, and the enemy cannot touch us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Give us the grace and the power to forgive, to love the church, and to live a holy life, Father. We thank you so much in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to this teaching. Our Lord is a beautiful Lord. He is a glorious God, and He is your Father. He loved you so much. You look at the snow behind me. You know that He created all this beautiful snow, and He want to make you beautiful in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, and He want to bless you. I believe that when you love the Lord and follow Him fully. And obey His command, obey His voice. He will lift you up, and He will make you beautiful in this generation in every way. May the Lord bless you, and I will see you in the next teaching.